there. Hello, Biology 107 students. This is a recording of topic 20 on viruses, COVID-19, and vaccines. This will be a two-part recording, and uh, as usual, if you have any questions, please do contact me, and I'd be happy to discuss the course material with you. So I often at this point actually ask the students, have you ever been infected by a virus? And most people know they have, whether it's a cold or the flu or something else. And I often ask students, have you ever been infected by a herpes virus? And usually people go silent because nobody wants to admit they've been infected by herpes. This is actually herpes simplex one. And uh, this is the virus that uh, causes cold sores. So let me just show you a few of the human herpes viruses. Herpes simplex 1, which you can see is the very first one on this list, is responsible for cold sores, and in some cases genital herpes. And there are a couple of studies that show that about 60% of us, that's the prevalence, 60% of us in the human population actually have uh, and are infected by this particular virus. So there's a good chance that more than half of us in this class are infected by herpes simplex 1. Uh, the other herpes, maybe more famous herpes virus, is herpes simplex 2. It usually causes genital herpes and sometimes cold sores, and it's closely related. In Canada, we're looking at about 10% of the population is infected by this. If you're not infected by the herpes simplex viruses, maybe you've been infected by one of these other herpes viruses. So the varicella zoster virus is actually human herpes virus number three. That causes chicken pox and shingles. And it used to be before the vaccines were available about 20 years ago, 95% of us would be infected by this particular virus in childhood. So before the age of 12, I believe it was. The, uh, the vaccine has changed that profile a little bit, of course. And uh, I'm not sure if there have actually been any newer studies on that, but 95% of us, huge amount of us have had herpes viruses. Uh, the other one on this list, you can see Epstein-Barr virus. This causes infectious mononucleosis, also sometimes known as mono. And this uh, virus infects about 95% of us by the time we are age 30. So some of you may have had it already. Some you have that to look forward to. This last group of human herpes viruses here are less common, or at least it's less common to have symptoms. You can see this uh, six disease, human herpes virus number six, is really common in infants. And uh, it's believed that 100% of us get this by the time we're age two or something like that. And uh, often it's a mild fever or if anything, sometimes no symptoms and we're all infected. You can see there's other human herpes viruses with high prevalence in the human population. One thing to know about herpes viruses is when you are infected, you are infected for life. And so if you had this infection once, it's hiding in your body somewhere. So most of us probably have been infected by at least two, three, and probably four different human herpes viruses. Uh, the one exception on this list is that last one down there. You can see this B virus. This is actually a virus found in monkeys and humans who get it, it is fatal. So I'm guessing none of you have this because you're still alive. So this is reflecting a few things that I wanna say about viruses just in general. Here are some virus facts, some things to think about regarding viruses. First of all, viruses apparently infect every living thing. Everywhere we look for viruses, we find them. So every species out there, whether it's a dog or a plant or an insect, they seem to have viruses that infect them. So they are found almost everywhere. In fact, we eat and breathe billions of viruses daily. If you had a salad today for lunch, chances are you ate some viruses. Some of these viruses were infecting these vegetables. Others may have been viruses that were infecting the insects that were walking on those vegetables back in whatever farm it was produced on. We have viruses that infect the bacteria in our gut. So E. coli has its own viruses. And I think uh, really the bottom line is that the vast majority of these things really do not impact our health. We have great immune systems and actually many viruses don't even affect humans. So they're not necessarily something to be scared of, but they are 
something interesting that is part of our biosphere. So what exactly is a virus? Let's talk about that for a few minutes. There's a definition of what a virus is. It says it's a minuscule, that means small, acellular infectious agent. So acellular means it does not have a cell, but it contains, it says in the definition, nucleic acids surrounded by a protein coat. So what you're looking at is some genetic instructions surrounded by a protein coat, and those genetic instructions basically infect cells and trick those cells in, uh, to using their machinery to make more viruses. And that's something we're going to talk about a little bit in today's lecture. Just want to uh, talk a little bit about minuscule, exactly how small are viruses. And one thing we can do is compare to human cells and bacterial cells. So if you take a look at this, here's some typical sizes. Human cell, maybe about 100 micrometers. Our haploid genome is about 3.2 billion base pairs and maybe about 20,000 genes. If we compare that to a bacterium such as E. coli, it's about 100 times smaller in terms of its actual size. The genome is basically a thousand times smaller and the number of genes, you know, maybe about four to five thousand genes. So quite a bit smaller in uh, several orders of magnitude. Viruses, on the other hand, are much, much smaller than even bacteria. So now we're looking at things that are in the nanometer scale. And it's very typical for a lot of viruses to have 10 or 15 genes. So they are, are very, very small and not nearly as complex as human cells or even bacterial cells. I'll show you another way to think about how small a virus is. If we take a human, this is not an average human, this guy's a little tall, two meters, but I took two meters to make the math kind of easy, so a tall person, and we can compare that to a, uh, a rhinovirus, so about 200 nanometers. So you're probably wondering, what's a rhinovirus? Let's write that down, rhinovirus. So rhino, you may have heard of the animal, or rhinoceros. What is its defining feature? It has a big nose. So a rhinovirus, actually rhino means nose. This is a virus that infects your nose. And so this is a pretty common type of cold virus. We'll talk about rhinoviruses once or twice along the way here. So let's do some math. And we can compare two meters to 200 nanometers. And we have to convert to the same units. So two meters is two billion nanometers. And so that means that a, uh, a human is about 10 million times larger than an actual virus. Here's another way to think about how big a virus is. Let's compare it to a few small objects. So there's a head of a pin, about two millimeters in size. There's a dust mite, about 300 micrometers in size. So we can see dust mites with our eyes, but they are very, very small. They look like the smallest speck you'd ever seen. For most purposes, they're very close to the resolution of the human eye. The resolution of the human eye is about 100 micrometers, so we keep using that as a bar. And we can compare that to a red blood cell, which is about 10 micrometers. So this is something we can only see with a microscope. Let's compare that red blood cell with a rhinovirus, which is 0 0.02 micrometers. So very, very tiny. So a rhinovirus looks like a speck compared to a red blood cell. So we can only see this with an electron microscope. If you think about it, uh, in terms of going back to that pin, about half a million rhinoviruses would fit on the head of that pin. So if you have a cold, one sneeze, you could be infecting thousands of people very, very easily in theory. So let's take a look at this uh, picture here. And we've seen this picture before in earlier lectures. It's comparing a eukaryotic cell uh, over here on the left, an animal cell with a bacterial or prokaryotic cell there on the right. You can see some of the features, the nucleus, of course, in the eukaryotic cell and the bacterial cell with no nucleus and a little bit smaller. And there's our little virus, which is basically a speck compared to the bacterial cell. This particular virus is an influenza virus and it has a membrane. Not all viruses have membranes and the genetic material is DNA or RNA. And we're gonna talk about that here in a minute. So let's talk about virus structure. What are they made of? They're made of some genetic instructions. It can be DNA or RNA. The DNA and RNA, it could be single-stranded or double-stranded. There's, there's different versions of genomes that viruses can have. And they're pretty much universally surrounded by a protein coat. 
This is a protective layer. It has a name, it's called a capsid. So for many viruses, that is it. It's a genome, RNA or DNA, and a protein code. So just some instructions, package, and protein. Some viruses, as I mentioned, have an, uh, a membrane. The, for viruses, we usually call this an envelope. Its functions are slightly different from that of a membrane, but this is something that they would take as they're budding away and escaping a host cell. They take some of the membrane or envelope with them. And typically on that envelope are proteins. These are viral glycoproteins. Sometimes we call these spike proteins because under electron microscope, they look like little spikes. Or in the case of the coronavirus, that's what we use and they look like little diamonds on a crown. I'll show you a few different virus structures here. They come in many shapes and sizes. You can see they all have a genome. So there's the genomes, RNA or DNA or RNA, and uh, they all have the capsid, so the protein coat, which is shown in that bluish purplish color. And uh, the one on the far right also has a membrane, which is known as the envelope. And I'll show, you, I'll show you a few more viruses here just so you get an idea of the different shapes and sizes. Uh, some viruses are helical, so they're kind of like long rods, and the, uh, the genome was wound up on the inside. So this includes the uh, tobacco virus and Ebola virus. Ebola virus is actually very long and sometimes uh, gets itself tangled like little knots. So very, very spaghetti-like. A lot of viruses are polyhedral. So polyhedral means it's made of many shapes and these shapes are triangles. So the capsid proteins form these little triangles. You get enough triangles together and you form a, a round three-dimensional structure that you can put the genome in. And this includes the poliovirus or adenoviruses. Adenoviruses can also cause uh, the common cold. There are a couple out there that cause the common cold. And then the last major group are the envelope viruses. And so these have a uh, capsid on the inside. On the outermost layer is some sort of uh, membranous envelope that has those spike proteins. So some examples there are HIV. That's, this is the virus that causes AIDS or human immunodeficiency virus. Of course, uh, the last couple of years, we've been familiar with coronaviruses. This is also an envelope virus. And this group also includes the influenza virus. So many viruses that infect animal cells are enveloped. Uh, it seems to be the biggest category. I'll show you one more category as well. We call this the complex viruses, meaning that the virus often is very similar to other viruses, but sometimes has, has extra features. So this is a bacteriophage. So what does bacteriophage mean? Bacterio means bacteria, phage means eating or eater. And so this is an eater of bacteria. So this is a virus that affects bacteria such as E. coli. If you take a look, it has a head, and the head looks just like your typical icosahedral virus with a capsid and a genome on the inside. And uh, down below, it has this big tail structure, and for whatever reason, this virus uses this tail structure to bind and attach to E. coli cells. And of course, well, there's the internet. I found this picture on the internet. I thought you might enjoy the cute little animation of the bacteriophage. So viruses come in many shapes and sizes, and uh, there are many types out there. And of course, we're interested in viruses because many of them do cause human disease. And these are particularly the ones that we study the most and know a lot about. Quick test yourself question. True or false, viruses contain both DNA and RNA. This is false. Viral genomes are made of DNA or RNA, one or the other. Question two, the protein coat that surrounds a viral genome is called the envelope. This is also false. The protein coat is called the capsid. So some terms that you need to learn for this class. So I wanna say a few more things about viruses and uh, eventually I'm going to get into coronaviruses, which is the hot topic of the last couple of years. First thing to say about viruses is they, uh, they generally infect a very specific cell type or host range. So HIV is a good example of something that infects only human cells, and it only infects a certain type of human cell. 
So a certain type of white blood cell called a CD4 T lymphocyte. And uh, you can see an image of it infecting that. So it's only, only one type of, of uh, animal and only one type of cell. There's another example there of a non-human virus. The T4 bacteriophage infects only E. coli. And some are a little bit more uh, promiscuous, meaning they can infect uh, multiple, multiple types of animals. So influenza A is a good example of a virus that can infect multiple types of animals, uh, mammals, such as humans, pigs, and many types of birds. So this is uh, something that gets around a little bit more and it's hard to get rid of because, of course, we're not going to go out and kill all the pigs and birds on the planet. That's, that would be the only way to get rid of it. And some viruses are really, really loose, meaning they can affect many, many different types of species. A rabies virus is a good example of this. It seems to be able to infect any type of mammal out there. And usually we're looking at carnivorous animals because it's spread by biting usually, but can affect almost any other mammal. So what about SARS-CoV-2? That's the virus that causes COVID-19, which we're going to talk about. It definitely affects humans. And there have been many other mammals that do seem susceptible. So cats and minks. Uh, I can't remember dogs. I think dogs can get it. I don't know if they get very sick, but they can get infected by it. So it does have a broad host range, uh, which is the term we use. So I want to talk a little bit about bacteriophage for a minute because they are the viruses that we know the most about. Bacteriophage are, of course, uh, infecting bacteria, so they're a lot safer to study in labs. And uh, this is why we know so much about them. You don't need a level three lab or anything to study bacteriophage. You can do this very easily if you can grow a coli in your lab. So we could do it here if we were doing research. We could study bacteriophage. There's a, an image there of one uh, or many infecting E. coli. I don't think that E. coli is going to make it. I just did a quick Google search to see what types of bacteriophage out there. I thought this was cute. There's many different types. Here's a lambdaphage. Here's one called PM2. Again, you can see they come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, MVL2. And of course, my favorite are the corn dog bacteriophage. They look like little corn dogs. So very cute. So what I want to show you is a very basic virus replication cycle, and this is a bacteriophage. And this life cycle is, uh, is seen in many different types of organisms, often modifications. Sometimes the virus has to get to the nucleus, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but we'll just look at a very simple basic type of virus life cycle called the lytic cycle. So lytic, by the way, means something like breaking. And you'll see where that comes in in a minute or two here. We're going to break something. We're going to break the E. coli cell. So the very first step is attachment. So what are we attaching? The virus is attaching to the surface of E. coli. So those tail fibers are able to recognize something on the surface of E. coli. It's either a lipid or a carbohydrate, and it's able to bind to that cell. Step number two is the DNA from the virus gets injected into the host cell. So in the case of this bacteriophage, it actually has enzymes that digest the cell wall, and you can see the DNA is being injected there in blue. And this particular virus does something a little extra nasty in that it, uh, my arrow is there, sorry about that. It uh, actually degrades the host DNA, and this is a complete takeover of this host cell. So once the DNA is injected, the DNA of course is instructions, and those instructions say, make more virus parts. So it does. So the host cell, the ribosomes and other machinery will make new viral genomes and new virus parts, uh, such as capsid proteins and tail proteins and those type of things. Eventually, this all gets assembled inside the, uh, the host cell. And then the lytic part, the breaking part, the uh, virus breaks out of the host cell and now can go and infect more cells. So in many cases, this is where we get our disease symptoms from. If you have a cold sore, those viruses literally are killing cells in your skin. And that's leading to little blisters on your, in many cases, on your face. Uh, if you have other viruses, maybe you have a sore throat from a uh, influenza virus or a cold virus, and uh, you're looking at that, that uh, virus actually killing cells in the back of your respiratory system, which is causing that sore throat and so on.
Uh, so what was this here? Uh, this was a video and it does not seem to want to play for me. So you can download the PowerPoint and check out this video. It's showing the bacteriophage infecting E. coli. Sorry about that. So I just want to say a couple of things about animal viruses in that the um, there are some differences between animal viruses and, and bacteriophage. Hopefully that is obvious. Uh, there's no cell wall in animal cells. So this actually makes it easier for animal viruses to infect animal cells. But we have a nucleus. Some viruses have to make it to a nucleus. Uh, some do not. It really just depends on the virus. Some replicate in the cytoplasm, some in the nucleus. Uh, many are enveloped. I think I mentioned that. And we see a huge diversity in, in viruses that can infect animal cells, which is always kind of interesting. So here is a video I'm going to play for you that is showing very briefly a, uh, a life cycle of a virus that infects an animal cell. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that uh, video there. Just a little short one to give you an idea of how a virus is, is replicating. There's a, another picture from the textbook this time, and it's showing uh, an animal virus replicating. And I don't need you to worry about all the details there. Again, the key thing is somehow its genome gets inside the cell, which you can see right here is the genome. That genome is replicated. And it's going to make messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is going to be read by, by ribosomes. Those ribosomes are going to make viral proteins. And eventually the cell is going to exit. It's going to break open the cell. Or in this case, it's actually showing the virus exiting the cell by budding, which is a different method for exiting a cell. Okay, so back to basically topic one, where we were discussing whether viruses are alive or not. And just want to remind you of what the features of life were that we talked about. We had concluded that cells are indeed alive. They show all the properties of life. So what about a virus? Let's take a look at this list. Does, does a virus have order and organized? Of course it does. Some of them have really nice shapes. Uh, so we can check that off. What about reproduction? Well, viruses don't really replicate by themselves. They need a host cell to do so. So this is sort of a gray zone. Do they grow? Kind of same thing with rep, uh, reproduction. They don't grow bigger, but they can they can replicate. Do viruses metabolize energy? No. Uh, so this does not fit the properties of life. Do they respond to the environment or homeostasis? No, not really. Viruses don't do those kind of things. Do viruses adapt evolutionarily? Of course they do. We're always talking about these new variants and new mutations, and we need a new flu shot every year. So they do adapt and change. So you can see this is why most scientists do not include viruses as living things. They are important for the biosphere, but they are usually considered more uh, infectious agents or particles by most scientists. Even though they do have some properties of life, they do not have all the properties of life. A couple more things before I wrap up this particular lecture. I want to talk a little bit about virus classification. And so something we're going to be talking about a lot during the entire semester is this diagram here where we can see uh, DNA can get copied, it can get transcribed to RNA, RNA can get translated to proteins, and this is how cells do their things. Uh, viruses, on the other hand, well, 
they don't have cells, so they can be a little bit more creative with how they get around uh, these particular processes. In fact, it turns out there are seven different ways viruses can do this, and this is a really common way for viruses to be grouped or classified. This is actually called the Baltimore system, but it's used internationally by, by most virologists. The uh, first method is having double-stranded DNA. That DNA is read uh, by uh, RNA polymerase to make RNA. The RNA, RNA is read by ribosomes to make proteins, and then you're getting new viruses. By the way, you don't need to know all seven ways. I'm just showing you the variety of viruses. That is the point of the slide, and there's one main point I'll make here at the end. Uh, another thing they can do is you can have single-stranded DNA virus, which is then converted to double-stranded DNA, which is then converted into messenger RNA. Some viruses don't even have uh, DNA. They start off with double-stranded RNA. Some viruses have single-stranded RNA. In fact, there's a tuple, couple different groups that fit into that category. Don't worry about the must and minus and plus. It means something, and we can talk about that later on in the semester if you're interested. Uh, some viruses do something really weird. They have RNA. They convert the RNA to DNA by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, RT, as you can see there. And then that double-stranded DNA is converted back into RNA. So that is a retrovirus. This is something that HIV does, which is kind of weird, but you know what? It's working for that virus. And the last group is a, is a different type of double-stranded DNA viruses, and I'm, and I'm not going to get into all the details on how that works. Like I said, there's seven groups, and really the bottom line is with all of these, oh, there's some examples that we've talked about, coronaviruses, influenza viruses, HIV, all belonging to different groups. So here's the key point. All viruses have to make RNA, the messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA is read by ribosomes to make new virus proteins. So there's the point of this whole slide, and there are different ways to do it. You can have an RNA genome, you can have a DNA genome, you can have single-stranded nucleotides, you can have double-stranded nucleotides. They don't do things the way cells do. So how do we classify viruses? It is a bit of a mess. There is an international committee. If you're interested in getting involved, I'm sure they're taking new members all the time. Uh, you can see this is showing the different types of genomes, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, and so on. Sometimes viruses are classified based on what type of organism they infect. So you could have a human virus, you could have an insect virus. Sometimes they're classified based on their shapes. So you've got these icosahedral ones with these envelope viruses. There are a lot of ways to classify them. Like I said, the, uh, the genome uh, gives you a lot of information about the life cycle. Uh, so that's uh, one of the most common ways to classify viruses. Here's a few human viruses, just for reference. You can see some double-stranded DNA viruses, adenoviruses we talked about. Some cause respiratory infections like the common cold. Herpes, herpes viruses we talked about already. And you can see that they can be enveloped or not enveloped. So many, many different types. Single-stranded DNA, uh, parvovirus causes a rash. Uh, double-stranded RNA, a real virus that causes rotavirus, which is uh, diarrhea, usually in children a very uh, bad type of diarrhea to get, and there's actually a vaccine for that. Single-stranded RNA, the coronaviruses, such as the rhinovirus that causes the common cold, and of course, coronaviruses, which is right there. And we're gonna talk about that next in part two of this recorded lecture series. Uh, another single-stranded RNA, uh, rabies virus, and of course, the retroviruses we talked about, HIV as well. So just some examples of human viruses, uh, just in case you're interested in this kind of thing. We'll finish off with this last slide and just a quick test yourself question. It says match the type of macromolecule with the viral component. So let's take a look and think about this here for a moment. And we said that all viruses have what? They have uh, some nucleic acids, right? So it's going to be RNA or DNA. And all viruses also have a capsid. So let's start there. So do we see RNA or DNA? Well, no, but uh, it's sort of implied there with genome, right? So this is going to be RNA or DNA. And of course, that is a nucleic acid, right? So that hopefully was the easy one. Now, I purposely didn't put capsid on here because I thought that would be an easy one. So I thought it'd make it a little bit more uh, complicated. 
Uh, so let's think about these. Let's go down the list. An envelope. What is an envelope made out of? It is a membrane. So membranes, of course, are made out of phospholipids. And that is the type of lipid. So we can connect there. Number three, glycoprotein. Well, a glycoprotein is made of carbohydrates and protein. Uh, so we could we could pick either, right? Carbohydrates here. We could also pick proteins. And then the last one, enzymes. Enzymes are made out of proteins. So just something to think about, uh, a different way to think about virus structures. We already answered this last question, which components are part of all viruses? So the nucleic acids, that's an Na plus the capsid. This is the end of part one of our recordings. And uh, uh, part two will be on uh, COVID-19 and vaccines.